casa. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Teambridge District Council's Planning Committee on the 25th of October. It's just about 10 o'clock, so we're going to make a start. Can I welcome all members, and we have um, speakers and, and guests with us as well. Can I introduce you to the officers I have with me at the top table at the moment? Um, Rosalind Eastman, Business Manager. Tris Corms, Democratic Services Officer, Suzanne Walford, Legal Department, um, Jennifer Jewell, our officer, and Chris Morgan and Sarah Selway, uh, Democratic Services. I'm Councillor Lingham and Bradbury. I'm going to be chairing the meeting today. So you're very welcome here. Um, can I just remind you, obviously we're in a, a public building, we're not expecting a fire alarm. I do have to take you through that kind of convention. If you do hear the fire alarm, um, please make your way to the car park. Can I ask if you have a mobile phone with you, if you could turn it to silent. Um, and if you're 
to all members and members of the committee, if you're not here for the whole debate on the application that we're looking at today, you cannot, you're not able to vote on the application. Um, please raise your hand when you wish to speak, and um, when the gentleman will come to you with the microphone, please speak clearly into that. Um, okay. Forward to the... Sorry, lots of paper on my desk here this morning. Um, so, forward to the agenda. Um, apologies for absence. I have uh, councillors Nuttall, Hayes, Piat, Haynes and Hugh Cox. Um, councillor Russell, um, if she turns up in the next few minutes, will be substituting for councillor Piat. Thank you. Are members um, content to accept the list of um, apologies as, as declared, please? Can I see a show of hands, please? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll then move on to... Um, sorry, I've got too much on my desk. Minutes. Apologies. Minutes of the last meeting. Um, our members... I see Councillor Dewhurst has already had his hand raised, maybe with a question, but are members content for me to sign this as a true record of the last meeting on the 27th of September? Councillor? Lovely. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, under item... Sorry. Under item 10, uh, declarations of interest, it states that I declared an interest in application 20 stroke uh, 00961 stroke MAJ. I didn't. I declared an, uh, an, an interest in, I haven't got the first two le uh, numbers, 00572, the, f the field. Uh, and um, I I'm the owner of a caravan park. So. Thank you. We will have that corrected for you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, could I have a proposal with um, the minutes with that amendment and a seconder, please? Happy to propose. Councillor, yeah. Councillor Dewhurst is happy to propose. I can see Councillor Nutley indicating he's happy to second. So can we go to the vote for, for accepting the, uh, the minutes with that amendment, please? Okay. Thanks. Any against? Any abstentions? I can see four. Thank you. Uh, that, that's carried, Chair. Thank you, that's carried. We're going to move on to declarations of interest. Any members have a declaration of interest for any items before us? Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said last time, as a boat owner who in the past has laid up a boat in this yard for the winter, I'm declaring an interest in this application and withdrawing from taking part in the determination of this application, coupled with the fact that I know the applicant quite well and I feel it only right and proper that others should determine this application. And that's 20 stroke, the application number is 20 stroke 00961 Major, Riverside Boatyard. Thank you, Councillor Clarence. Any other declarations of interest on this item? Councillor Nutley. Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, yeah, I think, uh, as, as before, I uh, uh, declare an interest, obviously, in receiving um, documents, but also this uh, comes under part of my uh, PH. Thank you. So are you intending to, to not vote on the item, or just you're well, just declaring no, an interest? Well, I've had no other dealings with that, so okay. I don't uh, see any reason to not to vote. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item, then. Thank you. Um... So, um, public participation, please. A bit choppy this morning, aren't I? Sorry. Chair, we have um, three speakers, one objector and two supporters for this application. Okay, thank you. Um, can I um, also point out to members that we are going to have a roll call vote to make sure we've got clarity on the numbers? Um, for this item. Um, members of the public, when it is your turn to speak, I'll call you to the front of the meeting to address the committee. Um, you will have um, 10 minutes to speak. Um, however, we have two um, members of the public who wish to, to come along as supporters, so you will have five minutes each. 
I believe that's the case. Uh, Chair, shall I just clarify? Please. Yeah, we have one objector, so as it's a major application, uh, they have 10 minutes, and supporters, we have two people speaking, so they have five minutes each. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So, um, if I could, and, um, first of all, obviously, uh, refer to the planning officer, Jennifer Jewell, to set the scene for the um, item. Hello, um, so I'm going to be explaining the scheme today. So this application is for a mixed use development and it is for a mix of industrial employment, well, employment comprising industrial and office, nine dwellings and 16 units of holiday accommodation. So the site location, I'm sure you will be familiar, it is on the edge of Timworth. It is within the estuary environment, within the River Teen environment. And it is just to the immediate south of the Broadmeadow Industrial Estate. Sorry, presentation is slightly slow. I imagine it will skip about five slides in one go now. Maybe if we escape. No, nope, it appears to have frozen. Excellent. Okay, I'll just continue to describe the scheme. So uh, the scheme is uh, the site is is approximately a one hectare site, and it is located within the northern boundary of the estuary. Access is from the A381, so which is the main road coming into Timmouth. And um, the scheme at the moment that oh dear. <laughs> crashed out of global. <laughs> oh shall we connect to mine? I don't know why it's done it. But... Okay. minutes. Apologies members, um, our connection to the remote computer in the office has uh, collapsed so it'll just take us one moment to, to get reconnected. Right, okay. <laughs> Great start. So, um, so this is the site location plan. So uh, this is the red line for the site. So this is where all development could take place within the red line uh, if permission were to be granted. And um, what you can see is this is the junction that you'll probably be familiar with, which is the A381 junction with the Broad Meadow Industrial Estate. And then this is the access bridge over into the site. This is the main line railway, the, um, the train line, and then you enter the site. And for members that took part in the site visit, you'll probably be familiar that you enter the site and you're at a slightly raised platform, and then you go round and the access road curves round back on itself as you enter the site. And you come round into the site this way. Uh, you may note that the applicant does not actually have control of the entire site. There is a bit of land which I understand is within control of southwest water. Okay, so this is the existing site plan. We've got a series of existing buildings on the site, and uh, members will probably be familiar that the site is currently used for boat storage as well. So there's sort of two main bodies of buildings here and here. Um, and that, yeah, so we move on to the aerial photograph of the site, which quite clearly illustrates that. We've got the boat storage is, uh, takes place across most of the site with the main two bodies of buildings. Members may have seen in the officer report there is reference to the non-designated heritage asset within the site, and that is located in, within this body of buildings on the right-hand side. 
You can also see there's the slipway on the east, sorry, on the western part of the site at the moment. It is actually proposed to install a second slipway to the eastern part of the site, which would be located over here. This is the proposed site plan for the development. If it were to go ahead, you would have four large blocks of buildings within the site. And those four blocks of buildings, three would be comprised of residential accommodation, and would, one would be comprised of the commercial floor space. This would be the commercial floor space building, and these three here would be the residential. In addition, we have the 16 units of holiday accommodation, and they would resemble beach huts, and they would be located on the far eastern and western sides of the site. So you would enter the site this way, in the same manner. You would then be met with the car park. The car park is a two-story car park, so there is in fact car parking underneath this level as well. And then you would go down the site slope, you would have access to the back of the commercial units here, and you would have access to the dwellings. If you went the other way, you would again go round and down in the same manner as existing. You would pass by the beach huts, and you would also pass by uh, what the applicant has proposed as an area of public open space green infrastructure. The exact design of that space has not been considered, that would be left to condition if the application was recommended for approval, um, but you can see that it would be located here. It has a slightly unusual uh, uh, section protruding out to the left. That is to reflect the levels of the site. You would have to walk along a raised footway in order to get to the raised area of space. And then if I move on to this plan, this plan basically is, is not actually the most up-to-date plan because it doesn't show the green infrastructure, but it is quite an effective illustration of the way development would proceed. So you can see that re remain the boat storage. You can see the holiday units on either side and the sea wall, which will be built around the site, uh, which would entirely cover the site, apart from obviously where you've got the slipway, and then this would be the new slipway on the eastern side. You can see the car parking here. This would be the bin store. This is the commercial block, the industrial block, with the uh, five proposed industrial units at ground floor with the office floor space above it. And then you can see the nine residential dwellings. They would comprise townhouse style development. So they would be dwelling houses, they wouldn't be flats and they would have parking at ground floor level and then go up to the living accommodation above. Um, yeah, so that's the main features of the site. We've also got uh, this bit of the site here in the middle, which would be the industrial bin store and the boat wash down area. Okay, so we'll look at what the buildings will actually look like. So. Um, this is the westernmost residential block. You remember I said there was three different residential blocks, was the westernmost of them. And this is essentially a terrace, but stepped terrace to reflect the arrangement of the site. So this would be the appearance of the buildings. And you can see this southern elevation would most likely be the most visually prominent. Obviously, if you're looking at the site from Ringmore or Sholden, you'll look at that elevation. So this is kind of the most prominent, you could say. If you were looking at the site from down the estuary, then you would be looking at uh, this elevation, so the west elevation. You can see on these elevation drawings, there's a, like dotted lines at the top. It says 1,900, sorry, 1,908. That is actually a reduction in height that was proposed by the applicant during the course of the application to respond to objections from the landscape officer that the buildings were too big. Okay, um, if we look at the floor plans just to get an idea for what the buildings would comprise. So these would be townhouse style development. You would have bookends of larger buildings with a smaller building in the middle. So the northernmost and southernmost building on this block would be a five-bedroom property with a study, and the one in the middle, which is a bit smaller, would be four bedrooms.
Okay. Then we look at the eastern residential blocks. So again, it's a broadly similar style of development, just the alignment is slightly different. So we've got more of a conventional terrace, um, quite similar to the other block. And again, the floor, the floor plans are very similar. They're not exactly the same, but they are a very similar approach with the garage and the parking at basement and then rising up to the living accommodation. This is the commercial building. So this would be the biggest building within the site. As you can see, you've got five industrial units at ground floor level. And then you go up to the office floor space above. And this would be like the central spine with like the stairs and um, utilities, etc. cetera. Um, and you can see again, the reduction in height that was proposed of the building in response to the landscape officer's objection. And this would be the floor plan for the industrial units. So it would be five um, spaces that I assume would be available for rent or sale, and uh, they would have access from both sides. And then the office floor plan, there's not really much to the office floor plan. It's um, open, flexible space. It could be subdivided into smaller office units, or it could be uh, rented, I assume, or sold, I assume rented um, at um, as large a floor plates, depending on market demand. And then these are the beach huts. So these would be individual units of tourist accommodation of, suitable for overnight stays, quite small, just comprising a kitchenette facility, a bathroom and uh, a, live, a small living space. OK, I'll go through the site photos now. So this is the site as it looks from Ringmore. This photograph was taken from the Strand in Ringmore, if you're familiar with that road. Yep, so you can see you've got the existing boat store. That's the A381 behind. This is obviously the edge of the industrial estate. Uh, another photo of the site, but this time without the zoomed in on the camera. So this is a view of the site from the Timmouth Shoulden Bridge. This is an important view because the Timmouth Shoulden Bridge is a Grade Two listed building, asset, not building, and um, you will be familiar from having read the officer report, officer's consideration of the heritage issues that it is considered that less than substantial harm would arise to the heritage asset if this scheme were to go ahead. Um, this is the site access. So it's quite narrow. It's not suitable for two vehicles. It's, on, it's only wide enough to have one vehicle and a pedestrian access. Okay, so as you enter the site, you recall that I spoke about this ramp that comes back down and back around. That is the ramp. Uh, that is the southwest water substation, which falls outside the applicant's ownership. And then this area of land being used to store materials at the moment is where the green infrastructure space would be proposed, which would be at a raised platform. Uh, at the moment, this again, this part of the site is being used for the storage of materials, but this would be dedicated to boat storage. This gives you quite a nice view of the listed bridge, the view towards Timmouth, and also the public right of way. So, um, members may be familiar, I don't know, there is a public right of way which runs along here, it's known as Footpath 9. It is only accessible at low tide. Uh, there has been discussion about this footpath forming part of the Teen Estuary Trail in the future, but that is not confirmed and there hasn't been a planning application submitted for that part of the Teen Estuary Trail yet. This is the um, right-hand side block of buildings, the uh, eastern block of buildings within the site, so you can see um, the what has been described as the non-designated heritage asset, which is these brick arches, the limestone. And this wall is essentially left over from the former gasworks use of the site. So historically, originally the site was a gasworks. It has been used for lots of different things recently, more recently. 
but uh, the reason the site was there originally was as a gas works. And then this is the western block of buildings within the site at the moment. Uh, so this is uh, just the western part of the site where the uh, site ends. This is where you would have the beach huts and the new sea wall. So obviously um, the rubble, etc., and the part of the foreshore would, would be lost and you would have a wall in place with the space made up by new made ground. Again, it's used for boat storage at the moment. And the final image, this shows um, essentially the existing slipway and, uh, and a view of the site within the setting of Sheldon behind it. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly explain what the officer recommendation is and the reasons for the officer recommendation. So the officer recommendation is one of refusal. There are seven specific reasons for refusal. There are um, substantive reasons for refusal and technical reasons for refusal. Substantive reasons for refusal, by which I mean reasons for refusal which couldn't be overcome by the applicant without a fundal, fundamental revision of the scheme. There are then technical reasons for refusal. These are matters which likely could be overcome by the applicant was additional information to be su submitted, a legal agreement submitted, uh, that type of thing. So we have particular concern, obviously, with the substantive reasons for refusal. The technical reasons have to be there, but could be overcome. So in this location in planning policy terms is located outside the settlement boundary for Timmouth. Members will likely be familiar that that means that the local plan does not support new housing in this location. It does support new affordable housing in this location because it is adjacent to the settlement boundary. But we do not have affordable housing proposed here or housing would be market housing. So we have conflict with the local plan in terms of the provision of new housing in this location. We also have new office floor space proposed here. It is acceptable to have new office floor space in the countryside under the local plan as long as compliance with certain policies is met. However, if you read the criteria of the policies, in particular the rural employment policy, uh, yes, the rural employment policy does apply here, <laughs> even though we are adjacent to the settlement, you, if you assess the criteria of that policy, you'll see that those criteria are not met. And the reason the criteria are not met principally is because of the designation of this site as the undeveloped coast. The undeveloped coast is a, a policy which applies to quite a lot of the district, obviously our coastal district, and to the, both the estuary environment and the coastal environment. Uh, it runs quite far up the Teen estuary and it includes this site. Now obviously this is a brownfield site, it's a previously developed site, but it does form part of that undeveloped coast policy designation. The policy therefore does apply and we are required to assess the scheme against compliance with that policy. The policy is quite strict. It sets out that only certain types of development will be acceptable in the location. Marine related development is acceptable. So officers do not have concern with the industrial boatyard use of this site. And we do not have concern with the industrial boatyard part of the application as proposed. But there is concern with the scale of the buildings in this location, the fact that they are particularly tall, narrow buildings with small footprints, which increases the impression of scale and height and the obtrusiveness of the development within the estuary. And we also have concerns that the development will lead to significant harm to the landscape character of the area. So those are the substantive reasons for refusal. We then move, oh, sorry. We then move to the technical reasons for refusal. So heritage has been given as a technical reason for refusal. Now, it would be possible to overcome the heritage concerns here. 
There's concern with the loss of the non-designated heritage asset within the site, which is that, <laughs> that wall that I showed you. So the wall um, is proposed for demolition. <coughs> the, as officers, we would expect that the development would be derived from uh, the, its local context, any items of any things of value within the site which could be preserved or replicated through the development to give a sense of place and a sense of context to the development. But obviously, the non designated heritage asset is proposed for demolition. And then we have the setting of the Timworth Sheldon Bridge, which is a Grade 2 listed asset. The applicant's own heritage advisor. Uh, heritage consultant, I should say, has advised that the scheme would result in less than substantial harm to that asset. Just to talk you through that a little bit, less than substantial harm is a phrase that's used within the MPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework. If there is any harm at all, we are required to give great weight to that harm and to require clear and convincing justification if you accept the harm and approve the development. We consider that the heritage concern could be overcome through a, a redesign of the scheme, which would incorporate the non-designated heritage asset into the scheme and would reduce the scale of the buildings on the site. There is the HRA payment, which is a requirement because we have some European sites within our district. We have the accessory Dorish Warren. Again, we do not have sufficient payment, so that is given as a reason for refusal. Could quite easily be overcome by the applicant. We have ecological harm. So this site lies within the county wildlife site. The whole of the estuary is a county wildlife site. We are within the estuary environment here. We're in flood zone three, so we're at the highest risk of flooding. This scheme is proposes a seawall around the entire site, and the seawall is proposed to require an additional 1,000 square meters of land take from the estuary. That will involve the loss of a, not quite 1,000 square meters of intertidal habitat. Uh, members who attended the site visit may remember we discussed this issue. So, um, the reason for refusal refers to an unmitigated loss of 838 square metres of intertidal habitat. That is not 1,000 metres. The reason this is not is because the applicant has proposed on the seawall to have essentially lots of... Uh, the design of the seawall would be... Um, have lots of small holes and indentations and features within it which would to some extent replicate the intertidal habitat. So there is some mitigation for the loss of intertidal habitat but we remain with 838 square meters of loss and we do not have any mitigation in place for that. We also have concern with impact on the native oyster. Again, these are technical reasons. They are things that could be overcome by the applicant. Amenity for future occupiers is a concern. So if we look at the site layout, here we are. So what you can see is that you've got the, in, the commercial block in the middle, and then immediate, which is here, and then immediately adjacent to it, you've got the dwellings. And there's really, they are in very close proximity. You also have the residential uh, holiday accommodation over here. And to get to that, one would have to park here, come round, or park underneath here, and travel across the site. We have concerns with the workability of this arrangement. Is it really the best layout? And will it preserve amenity for future occupiers? Um, this has been considered by the applicants, but we remain concerned with the impact of introducing new residential uses here onto what is a boatyard space, 
and the impact that might have then on the future operation of the boatyard. We do not want to contail the operations of the boatyard. This, we want to support the operations of the boatyard. We don't want to be in a position where we are having to limit the operations of the boatyard from a noise perspective or an hours of operation perspective, when essentially this is a boatyard space and that is the type of, that is the part of the development that we wish to support because it complies with policy. Uh, and then finally, we get to the green infrastructure. So because the green infrastructure wasn't thought about from the start, it was a, a change that was made during the course of the application. It's this little bit of uh, blue land, as shown on this plan, which is very much a little island of uh, public open space. What we would like to see is a soft landscaping strategy for the site which provides a green environment where the, the built environment is integrated with the green environment. So we don't just have an island of green within an otherwise urban site. Um, there's also concern that uh, certain elements of the policy have not been met. That would need to be met through a financial obligation. That hasn't been proposed by the applicant, so again, it forms part of the reason for refusal. Um, so, yeah, so that is all of the reasons for refusal. This site is quite complex. There's a lot of different constraints applicable to this site. Um, so we're very happy to take any questions that you might have. And um, I think we'll draw the, the uh, presentation to an end there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, so... I'm not seeing any indication that there's questions at the moment, so I, I would like to move on to um, the next person to speak. Yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> could, could I just ask what, what is going to be to the south of the buildings in, in that area that is beige? Yeah, there. Yeah, so right. the majority of the space of this site, as you can see with all of the boats as shown on the drawing, that's just proposed to be retained as boat storage space. Right, so, so that will be tarmac or...? I don't know what the final surface material would be for that. Okay. It hasn't, hasn't been agreed through the development. It would need to be agreed before development right. proceed. And, and the bit between the boat storage and the building, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. will that be, please? There's no, there's no particular proposal for that bit of land. One assumes it would be used as circulation access space in order to get to the holiday accommodation that's on that far side. Um, at the moment, the site quite closely resembles this. You know, there isn't a clear demarcation, and it's assumed that that same arrangement will continue. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, not seeing any other indications now, apologies. Um, we will now move on to um, the objector who wishes to speak, and it's Joe Cumbly. hope I'm pronouncing that right, if you'd like to come forward. And you're going to have 10 minutes to speak from the moment you start, so can you make sure the, the microphone is, is... Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to speak at the committee, and I'm here to speak in opposition to the proposed development. I note that this is an application that has been thoroughly considered by Teambridge planning officers in their very detailed report of the 25th of October, and I wholeheartedly endorse the officer's recommendation that you refuse permission. I anticipate that the applicant will seek to persuade you today that this development is largely about supporting local businesses. However, in response, I would simply point out that only one of the buildings they propose would be for commercial use, as opposed to 16 units of holiday accommodation and nine open market houses. There would be no affordable housing built on this site at all. This is therefore primarily a housing development on a highly desirable riverside plot. Turning now to the report, as the officer notes, the principle of this development, specifically the provision of open market dwellings and new office floor space in this location, is contrary to the Teambridge Local Development Plan, specifically policies S21A, S22, EN2 and EC3. The council can currently demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, 
Accordingly, there is no overriding need to secure residential development on the site. Notwithstanding this, the tilted balance at paragraph 11 of the National Planning P Policy Framework would not be engaged even if a five-year housing land supply could not be demonstrated because harm to designated heritage assets has been identified. This is confirmed at footnote 7 of the NPPF. Furthermore, it is clear that the very viability of this proposal is in question. The Council's viability assessors concluded the overall scheme to be unviable, and your officers in turn are concerned that the scheme is undeliverable. Officers are of the opinion, as set out in paragraph 8.5 of their report, that it is highly unlikely that it would ever be built in its present form. Additional development of the most valuable parts of the scheme would likely be necessary in order to improve viability. If this were to be the case, any future revisions would surely lead the applicant to seek an increase in the provision of open market housing on the site, which is confirmed as being in conflict with the development plan policies. In terms of design, I firmly support the officer's conclusion that the development would neither protect nor enhance the undeveloped coast or character of the, of the locality. In fact, the inappropriate scale and sheer magnitude of this development would have a wholly unacceptable impact on the landscape character and appearance of the riverscape and coastline, and so, I'm afraid, represents poor and unsympathetic design. This is again clearly contrary to adopted policy. In addition, I fully agree with your reporting officer that the development will harm the significance of important heritage assets and that there are no overriding public benefits having regard to the relevant tests here, set out at paragraphs 199, 200 and 202 of the NPPF. The NPPF requires that any harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset requires clear and convincing justification. This duty to protect and enhance such assets is mirrored in policy EN5 of the local plan. Section 66 of the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act, 1990, places a duty on local planning authorities to pay special regard to the desirability of preserving listed buildings and their settings. In this case, the applicant's own heritage appraisal and impact assessment noteworthily only submitted to the Council two months ago, concludes at Section 5 that the proposed new development would be quite prominent in views from designated heritage assets where setting plays an important part in their significance. There are areas where there clearly would be some adverse heritage impact, notably from the northern end of the Shalden Bridge, where the rural view up the estuary would be partly blocked resulting in some less than substantial harm to the significance of the heritage asset. That's the applicant's own report. Your officer's report agrees with the heritage appraisal's conclusion, confirming that less than substantial harm would result, and at paragraph 11.13 comments that, from a heritage perspective, the comprehensive redevelopment of this site with large new buildings will result in a significant change to the character of the area. The development will dominate the view west and up the estuary, introducing substantial new built form onto a site which currently reads as part of and at the level of the estuarine environment. <coughs> the significance of the bridge as the largest built environmental structure within the estuary will be harmed, as will an appreciation of its attractive open setting. In addition to the adverse impact of the proposals on Grade 2 listed Shalden Bridge, I would draw your attention also to the impact on those heritage assets just across the river from the boatyard, which are protected by the Ringmore Conservation Area Management Plan, adopted by Teambridge in 2008. The plan states that Ringmore occupies an outstanding natural setting, fronting the, te the estuary of the Teen, and its most valued asset is the east-facing estuary frontage that projects dramatically forward of the shoreline. This is Ringmore Strand, a road comprising of eight houses, five of which are Grade II listed buildings, that the applicant accepts in their own heritage appraisal will be affected by the prominence of this proposed development. 
The Ringmore Plan further states that it will always be important to consider the impact any development proposals might have on Ringmore's estuarine setting, particularly when viewed from the opposite bank, the length of Ringmore Road, and from the estuary itself. Members, as you will be well aware, Ringmore Strand is almost exactly opposite the proposed river level development, and any such view from the of, the, of the strand from the east, from Shalden Bridge, Ringmore Road, and from the estuary itself, also encompasses a clear view of the riverside boatyard. It must be accepted, therefore, that the setting of valuable heritage assets, including a whole conservation area, will be directly and adversely affected by these proposals. It is apparent that the applicant has not provided clear and convincing justification to support the proposal in heritage terms, and I endorse your officer's conclusions that there are insufficient public benefits to outweigh the identified harm to the designated heritage assets. Turning to the landscape harm resulting from the scheme, the, la the officer's report makes it clear that this is also of considerable concern. The applicant's own landscape and visual impact assessment concludes that the impact to the site character would be, quote, slight averse, impact to the landscape character would be slight moderate adverse, and a moderate adverse impact would result to visual amenity. Again, this is the applicant's own report. This is a prominent site within the teen estuary, and despite some revision to the scheme, it is clear that the quantum and sheer scale of the development will adversely impact the openness and expansive cross-estuary views, which are identified as key characteristics of the teen estuary landscape character area, as confirmed within the Council's landscape character assessment. The proposal includes a significant number of imposing buildings, which are up to five storeys in height, making them similar in height to the broad meadow flats on the hills above, flats which members, I'm sure you'll agree, no one could argue ha have enhanced the estuarine environment from a landscape point of view. It would clearly be wrong to have buildings of this scale on the very bank of the beautiful River Teen, where they would, be at, where they would adversely dominate the riverscape when viewed from miles around. There is no convincing argument advanced by the applicant that these significant impacts to the landscape character and undeveloped coast should be allowed through the granting of this application, and indeed the lack of meaningful landscaping proposals as part of this scheme further adds to everyone's concerns on this issue. There are many other concerns raised by officers, all of which I fully support. I think I'm about to run out of time, however. Um, in conclusion... Your officers have identified that this scheme is clearly contrary in many respects to your adopted plan policies. It is also contrary to national policies, which are clear that the planning system should be genuinely plan-led. And it is important, particularly where there are no reasons to otherwise do so, that the plan and its policies should be followed. This scheme clearly and cl sorry, simply and clearly does not follow plan policy and should not be granted permission. I therefore respectfully request that the officer's recommendation is supported and members resolve to, res to refuse planning permission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crumbly. Um, Shall I turn this off? Yeah, thank you. If you'd like to retake your seat, thank you. We will now move on to um, supporters' time to speak. And I think there's been a slight change. We have Peter Stenner coming forward first, if that's right. Thank you. If you'd like to take a seat, you will have five minutes from the time that you start speaking. If you'd like to switch the microphone on in front of you. Members of the committee, good morning. I'm the applicant for the scheme, Peter Stenner. My company, Timoth Maritime Properties Limited, owns and operates the boatyard. I grew up in Timoth. I went to Brookhill School, where Little now stands, and attended Timoth Grammar School. I left in 1978 starting work for the family who ran the local boat hire and fishing business. When the proprietor retired in 1982, I bought the business and we still trade there today, employing a boatman and seasonal staff. In 91, myself and a good friend started Timoth Maritime Services. We are still based in Teambridge and operate both locally and nationally, employing more than 100 people, the majority of which live in Teambridge. 
Five years ago, I secured the Riverside site from South West Water. My initial plan had been to continue using this as a boatyard and a ref repair and maintenance facility for our own fleet of vessels. But it soon became apparent that there was a serious ongoing demand for improved boatyard facilities for local boat owners. As this plan evolved, it was clear that I could offer a unique opportunity to give something back to the town. I have a long history with the boatyard, which extends well over 40 years. Having worked on my own boats in the old existing buildings, been involved as the Marine Superintendent during the construction of the South West Water Clean Sweep Scheme throughout the estuary and through the boatyard, and now as owner and managing director of the current boatyard. This design has been progressed from my wish to provide several specific facilities to meet and enhance the needs of the community, including fledgling businesses, visitors, and at the same time secure the site for generations to come. I'm trying to give something back to the town that I grew up in and live in with my family. Given the heavy industrial history of the site, we need our proposal to address any harmful materials which are there and protect future users and the river. As such, the scheme includes a robust seal wall to effectively, effectively sorry, encapsulate the site, which will protect it from flooding and prevent any potential leach of contaminants back into the river. This has been agreed with the Environmental Agency <coughs> and gained from the demanding requirements sorry, and gained permission from the demanding requirements of the Marine Management Organisation, the MMO. Our neighbours, the Crown Estates, sold us part of their river funders for the purpose of this regeneration and are fully behind the scheme. I have experience of a delicate balance for small businesses between premises and profit. What we are proposing would see the construction of proposed built units which will be occupied by the maritime businesses who currently trade from the site but at a price which allows them to grow and thrive. There is a distinct lack of office facilities in Timoth and the surrounding area. The proposal addresses that need. To effectively provide a subsidy for the very substantial cost of building the vital seawall and assist with keeping the commercial elements of the project at a level affordable to local businesses, it was decided to include an element of residential accommodation within the overall project. This residential element has been designed to sit comfortably here and in that context was noted by the council's landscape officer that, quote, the design responds positively to the context of Tynmouth and undoubtedly brings benefits, unquote. The idea of mixed-use residential and boating services is a proven concept in Dartmouth, Exmouth, Totnes, Falmouth and Solcombe, amongst other places. The River Teen is very much a poor relation when compared to other parts, ports sorry, along the South Devon coast. I know this to be true as my other companies worked and continues to work in most of them. This scheme will start to redress the balance. Given the success of similar schemes elsewhere in the district, it was decided to include tourist accommodation in the form of beach huts. Given the changing face of the tourism industry and the lack of appropriate accommodation close to the River Teen, advice from industry experts with whom we have consulted suggests that this would offer a very popular facility. Before approaching the planners, the proposals were discussed with local community groups to ensure they were supportive of the overall plan. These included, included local residents, town and district councillors, the Harbour Authority, the Teen Fishermen's and Watermen's Association, oyster and mussel fishermen from the River Teen, the Crown Estates and boatyard users. The scheme was home to ensure that it met their wishes and requirements. And with a leap of faith and support from you, the committee, I can convert this run-down brownfield site into an area that will bring significant benefits to one of the poorest wards of Teenbridge and establish a facility for future generations. Good time, Thank you very much, Mr. Stone. Thank you. Can I call on uh, Martha Grecos, please? Hope I pronounced that right. Please take a seat. If you'd like to switch on the microphone, and again, you have five minutes when you start. Good morning. My name is Martha Grecos and I'm the barrister representing the applicant here today with regards to their proposed application. 
As you heard from the applicant himself, there are many benefits this scheme will bring, including the positive impact for the business on site through improved facilities and affordable rent, a positive income on local tourism, a positive impact on housing supply, and of course, a positive impact in terms of construction of a seawall to protect from flooding, which has been approved by the Environment Agency and the Marine Maritime Organisation. The scheme is supported by local and wider community. To date, around 64 supporting statements have been received by the officers and only about 22 objections. Most recently, you will have received supporting letters from the following people and organisations. One, the British Marine Southwest, which is the trade association body for the leisure marine sector, emphasising the need for shoreside development, the safeguards marine-related services. Secondly, the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, which has no objection to this application as all its concerns with regards to the shell, fish, uh, shell fisheries and possible water quality issues have all been addressed through the construction of the surrounding wall and measures to contain any silt and potential pollutants. Thirdly, tenants of the Riverside bo Boatyard who want and need high quality modern facilities to support their business. Fourthly, Knight Frank, on behalf of the Crown Estate, who highlighted that the sale of the areas of the foreshore are rare, but the Crown Estate knew of the proposals and decided to sell as a gesture of support for the investment and development of the site. And fifthly, a local fisherman who supports the scheme for the much needed employment of local people. It is fair to say that this scheme has not been easy to bring forward. The initial planning officer worked with the applicant towards a positive outcome. However, with the replacement officer, there's been a change in the approach due to the lack of engagement and delays, which have prevented the applicant from bringing forward a fully rounded proposal. For example, it took six weeks for the council to validate the application. There has been a lack of input from conservation officer and landscape officer, which has led to a failure to comprehend the contents of the report. And the planning officer refused to review additional reports submitted, in effect predetermining this application already, but stating that it will be refused, even though further documents were still being submitted and the applicant's team was awaiting responses. The planning committee report before you today was even written up in advance. Notwithstanding this, we believe that the proposals can be given consent and that any concerns can be ameliorated through the imposition of planning conditions on the permission or planning obligations in the Section 106 agreement. For example, the applicant is willing to make a financial contribution to green space, um, to make a financial uh, to green space off-site. The applicant is willing to agree to a phasing plan which dictates that the housings and beach huts can be constructed once the other buildings and infrastructure have been completed. And the applicant is willing to pay a greater habitats regulations assessment fee to cover the beach huts. None have been added, asked or proposed by the council, and if they were, the applicant would have agreed to this. It is also worth stressing that the council, and as a result the local community, will receive in the region of 550,000 of community infrastructure levy um, at nine dwellings towards the council's five-year land supply and a, tax counts, ta a council tax revenue in excess of £10,000 per annum. So that's £550,000 of sale and £10,000 per annum in terms of tax. I therefore urge you to resolve to grant consent for this scheme to say. Your officer highlighted one substantive reasons and two technically reasons. And the actual uh, objector said that um, these cannot be ameliorated. However, this is a balancing exercise that you are allowed to do given the benefits that we have highlighted. And as you know, there will always be some change when a proposal comes forward. But there is nowhere where it was stated that these were so adverse as the objector claims through the choice of her own words. Secondly, in terms of technical reasons, I've already set, highlighted quite clearly how these can be overcome. And even your officer yourself said these can be overcome by the applicant. I therefore see that there is no reason why you should be refusing the application today. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Right, we also have ward members with us who um, wish to speak. Um, I believe, Councillor Jeffries, you're first to come along. If you'd like to come to the front, please. If you switch on the microphone, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Colleagues, I'm here before you today as Ward Councillor for West Tynmouth, the area where the application is proposed. West Tynmouth and the gateway to the town is dilapidated and run down, not the entryway to the beautiful tourist destination it deserves to be. My ward has historically been a mix of industrial and residential, and improvements are greatly needed to the area in order for it to thrive. Business plays a vital role in the economic development and wealth of such areas. Success in business translates to the economic well-being of its residents through job creation and offering improved quality of life for citizens, all of which have been outlined in this application. Indeed, Riverside Boatyard's application not only builds on these requirements, its strategic vision safeguards the delivery of marine-related services, preventing relocation and transference of wealth outside of Teambridge. TMS themselves are local, as we've heard, have not only a long standing in the community in which they wish to make these vast improvements, but bring a wealth of expertise in building successful developments in marine environments. Their vision and values underpin the projects. Oh, it's gone. Sorry. <laughs> Their vision and values underpin the projects they get involved in, both in the UK and Europe. They have led the field in marine and civil construction, flood defences, harbours, marinas, and many more. Some of the prestigious work they've undertaken is too long to list, but includes Timworth Seawall, Oxen Cove, and Brixham. Isle of Man Marina, Portland Port, and Network Rail, Chippenham. In working closely with developers and investors with this level of expertise ensures the best for all of our communities. The comments from the public in the application and from those I've spoken with in preparation for today regarding the development are hugely supportive, as we've heard. To date, the application has, re has revised and updated their viability plan, biodiversity information approved by the Environment Agency, carbon reduction plan and acoustic report, among other things. It is hoped that full consideration should be given to the applicant ac across all aspects of the application and what it will bring. There are definable public benefits, affordable industrial units and office space taking account of SMEs with currently nowhere to go. The plans include improving the current usage environment, as we've heard, such as a longer and safer slipway, removal of contaminants and provision of a raised footway to connect the town, linking to the proposals for the Teen Estuary Trail. There is reference to how the dwellings aspect will work alongside the industrial element of the site, and the applicant has demonstrable expertise in developing such, such as in Brixham. Due to the nature of the scheme, the current boatyard is not fit for purpose, and there are no other available sites that this development could occupy with access to the water. Developments such as these provide valuable services, products and tax income that de direct, directly contribute to the health of the community. They also provide jobs, strengthening the economic health of each community where the business is based. The Riverside development will contribute vital employment to encourage the success of West Timmouth and Team Bridge as a whole, encouraging a sense of civic pride and investment in where people live. A knock-on effect that will bring a rejuvenation to an area that desperately needs it. The viability study outlines 18 million of investment into the area, as we've heard, and it is worth noting that West Timmouth is ranked one of the most deprived areas of the country, currently in the top third for levels of deprivation. It is impressive to note that the applicants shares the concerns of Crown Estates, who historically do not make sales of their acquisitions lightly. Crown Estates, in their letter of support, detail that they have sold the land due to the works proposed within this development, offering a long-term solution to improve subsidence and remove contamination, making safe the area for long-term benefit. A large amount of sale linked to the development of the Riverside Boatyard could be used to further maintain the much-needed infrastructure for the area. 
supporting services which are essential to the good health and benefit of the community. So it will not just be the private enterprise profiting, but that of the council on the behalf of the community. Regeneration is directly related to the economic health and well-being of the people in that locality. Profitable businesses drive economic health, which translates to a better quality of life for the community. The application outlines the expertise and due diligence in, relate, in relation to water quality, flood defence and longer term impact on sustainability. Businesses on the nearby Broadmeadow estate and Timoth Chamber have indicated they are welcoming the development in bringing improvements and jobs to the area. Investments in regeneration such as Riverside Boatyard boost economic revenue directly and positively affect the health, quality and life and purchasing power of residents in the local community, vitally important during these turbulent times. The project presents sill monies of 550k, as we've just had, and an opportunity to work with a business prepared to invest in one of the most deprived communities in Teambridge. An opportunity to drive economic growth for generations to come a positive narrative for the future of our currently struggling marine economy, which requires much needed investment. Applications like these need to be looked at in the context of the current fiscal environment and economic downturn, impacts of which are predicted to be long lasting and set to get worse as the UK and Europe seek to drive down consumption. The applicant has developed a strong relationship with South Devon College, a stakeholder of TDC whose marine education has been one of the fastest growing areas of late. The relationship is set to flourish as the applicant seeks to include at the boatyard classroom space for South Devon Co College and a route to employment through apprenticeships. Demonstrating the applicant's willingness to work within policies such as the recovery plan and alongside our stakeholders to prove, provide meaningful local opportunities and growth for the sector. We are all aware how employers and business owners are increasingly str struggling to retain productivity due to the rising costs of fuel and utilities, which in turn put a strain on people having to cover their costs of travelling to work. Priority should be given to developments like Riverside, whose employment and investment proposals are focused on local expertise and job creation saving the consumer long term, but also investing in local trades in the immediate future who would be procured to realise the development, keeping wealth in Teambridge. This is more than just an application, it is an opportunity to weather the storm of recession. To have widespread support from such a broad scope of agencies on an application which is not only impressive, but has the community and users at its heart, presents an opportunity to work cohesively. A positive outcome for this application today will ensure the investment is primed to create a lasting positive impact on the community, job security and the economy for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. Uh, Councillor Cox, you wanted to speak on this item as the other ward member. If you'd like to switch on the microphone. Thank you. I think it's all, all been said. Uh, I think I want to declare my brother Tim is a Harbour Commissioner. Uh, just not, not that's an interest, but I want to make that clear from the beginning. Um, but if we get to the bottom of planning, it, we ought to look at the preamble to the Town and Country Planning Act. And that basically says an act to provide for uh, uh, con, uh, setting out um, planning for the public interest. Now, this application is massively in the public interest. It's in the interest of Team Bridge. It's definitely in the interest of West Timbeth. Um, Peter is a well-known local entrepreneur. Even when I'm on the litter picks, I see him mending the shed. It's not gone to his head. You know, this is a massive investment in Tynmouth and in Teambridge, and we really need to do that. We have brought it, that is by no means is that an undeveloped coast. That is an old gas works with a brownfield site with contaminated land, uh, and therefore, and it's a boatyard now. So really, we should be supporting this application. There is uh, people used to live on site uh, when it was gas works. Um, we have a shortage of holiday of holiday accommodation in um, in Teambridge. We know that, so actually that's helpful. So we should support this application. It, it represents a good good news story for Tynmouth and Teambridge, 
as a planning application, but it's opens up, it's a, it opens up the door to regeneration projects, the walkway to, between poly steps and uh, riverside would enable the cycle path, if it ever gets, uh, gets bit built, to move, go across the road into, straight into the town by a walkway between riverside, uh, through the arch in, in Shouldham Bridge, and along the public footpath uh, on the docks. So there's massive regeneration possibilities that come from giving permission to this application. Um, we'd, perhaps we were mistaken to have not had to had this as an undeveloped coast, but it is an industrial site. It always has been. It has been since the 19th century. Um, so we should support this application. It, uh, the benefits to Timmouth and to Team, which are so great that it's worth ignoring the plan. We have, we have um, with TE3, we've expanded the area into the undeveloped coast um, Moved, made that area larger. Um, so we have done this before. We have moved into the undeveloped coast where there's, we've been shown that there's a benefit. There's a massive benefit here. And I would just like to point out that Bridge is not, the entire structure of Shouldham Bridge is not a two-star listed building. It's either end, the shoulder, the shoulder stone end, uh, built with slave, slave uh, trade money. Um, it's, uh, it's, either, it's either end of the bridge uh, that are, in fact, um, listed. Um, the main part of the bridge is, in fact, um, not, not listed. Uh, so it's not the whole bridge. Um, and if you were to be at the end of Shouldham Bridge and you were to look to the east rather than the west, you would see a boatyard owned by Teamish District Council called Poly Steps. I mean, it, it's, I'm sorry, some of these arguments have been ridiculous when you look at what's already there. So I think we should support this application. It will tidy up this site. It's not in Peter's interests to make an untidy or an, 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 a, a, a carbuncle on the side of the river. Nothing is, is, la is higher than the highest point of the old gas works, um, which you can see in the minutes of the, the Town Council of the Heights. Um, uh, so I think we should support this application, though it goes against our um, uh, uh, policy, because if you open your eyes and look at it, it's already an industrial site. It would just be making it more of an industrial site. And you know, as I say, we do need the, we do need the uh, holiday accommodation, so that's a welcome development. Um, as I say, a load of other potential uh, benefits are going to come to Timmouth. We have the worst polluted roads, one of the worst polluted roads in Christendom, in the Bitten Park Road. By, by, by opening the key to the walkway, we could, we could move to help deal with the pollution on that road. So I would hope that, the, that members would support, uh, accept this application, uh, possibly add conditions, but please support it. It has the support of all of Tinmouth, it really does, and it's, it's, um, it's a massive investment, it's a massive vote of confidence in Teambridge, and we should, we should take this with both hands. Thank you, Councillor Cox. If you'd like to switch, thank you. Bring you in just one moment. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I, yeah. You could explain that to Yeah, okay. No, that's fine. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Um, I, I note you um, your, uh, wanted to come in. Can I, first of all, can we go through the, 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 sp the speakers at this point um, and look at the, the site inspection um, team? Ask the, the members of the site inspection team to also give their points of view, please. I know Councillor Petherick, Councillor Kurzweil, and Councillor Parker, I think you all three of you were, were in that that point. Was that? Okay, all right. Um, I'm also um, informed that planning officers wish to, to make some comments as well. So, um, just to address two factual inaccuracies that were raised in the second wall councillor's comments about the listed building. First of all, the listed building listed asset I should say which is the bridge it does comprise the full extent of the bridge but members may be familiar from driving across the bridge that the fabric of the bridge most of the fabric of the bridge is of modern construction so it, the historic fabric is only at either end that doesn't mean that the whole of the structure isn't listed the whole of the structure is a listed asset and we are legally obliged to consider the setting of the listed asset as a whole and then secondly the public right of way so there's a suggestion that this scheme will in some way facilitate or um, allow the teen estuary trail to come forward 
That, that is not the case. This scheme will not preclude the delivery of the teen estuary trail. It will have no impact on the delivery of the teen estuary trail. When the application was originally submitted, the applicant did propose to provide a public right of way across the bridge through the site to footpath nine, which is a possible intended route of the teen estuary trail. However, during the course of the application, that offer was withdrawn. So we no longer have a proposal for a public right of way through here. That's not to say that, that one couldn't be negotiated in the future by Devon County Council, and that would be done separately, most likely separately to the planning regime uh, in it, through a private agreement. But to say that this scheme will fa facilitate the teen estuary trade, that's not actually correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, just for that clarity, um, could I ask, um, I don't know who wants to go first from the site inspection team. Councillor Petherick, you've you raised your hands first. If yes, what I would like, could I sit there? It's got some paperwork and I'm going to struggle with it. Right now, so I'll just move over there. Absolutely fine. Thank you. Okay, good, good morning. Uh, yes, I, I attended this, this site visit on the 4th of August. It was an interesting site visit, and I've come away from there with three areas of concern. Um, I'm happy to elaborate on those three areas now, if you like, Madam Chair. Absolutely fine, yes, Okay, please. thank you. Uh, there have been a number of references made to the construction of the sea wall. Um, this site has been partially, is partially reclaimed land from the sea over many decades, I guess. And the sea wall will go beyond the, exist the, the boundary of the existing land. Now, this, now there is a figure in the, biod the Biodiversity Officer's Report, which is section 12.8, which advises that there will be a loss of intertidal area of 1,010 square metres because of the construction of the wall. But however, the wall will have sort of little forks deliberately built into it, which will encourage sea life to attach itself to it. But there's still going to be a loss of 838 square metres of, of uh, estuary. Now, I've done some calculations because it's difficult to visualise what 838 square metres looks like. But to, I'll give you an example. A, a, a doubles tennis court is 23.77 metres long, 10.97 metres wide. That equals 260.75 square metres. If you divide the 803, 838 square metres by the size of a doubles tennis court, you will get in 3.21 tennis courts. So that just shows you how much of the estuary we're going to lose and the, the detrimental effect that that will have, a substantial effect it will have on marine life, on the estuary. A second point is, excuse me if I'm thumping through paperwork here, is regarding overdevelopment. Um, the, well, some form of development could be appropriate for this site, and, and I hope that we see something there. The proposal is a gross overdevelopment for what is highly visible, a highly visible location from the teen estuary. Aside from the height, which is going to be quite considerable, the style is ill-fitting for this location, and I feel that uh, it would be inappropriate. My third concern is regarding the highways report. Now the, the higher wage report refers to uh, a survey that was carried out on the 2nd of November 2020. I mean we were in the, in the depths of Covid at that time and not many people were travelling. Uh, the highways appreciated this. This was also done on a Tuesday, the 2nd of, which is quite a quiet day. I mean I would have preferred it to done on a Friday, but it was done on a Tuesday. Um, uh, and the highways realised that perhaps this wasn't perhaps accurate an indication of the volume of traffic flowing past that area. So they took into account some figures from January 2018. Uh, now, we're looking at sort of figures for the depths of winter and not necessarily at peak times during the tourist season during sort of July and August. There's also a reference in the report that uh, 
there have only been five slight collisions reported by the police in the vicinity. Well, that was absolutely right. Up until the 1st of August, when there was a fatality there, a motorcyclist was killed there. That was at the junction of um, Newfoundham Road and also Bishop Staten Road, where this actual survey was carried out. I, I, I've, I have grave concerns, as I say, about the access to the site from the traffic lights. I have used it myself, um, not, not recently, and I've found it, if you're, particularly if you're towing a trailer, it is a difficult one to get into. In view of the, the, sort of the, the, the rather inaccurate sort of figures for the, for the, the traffic survey, I, I, once again, I have to express concerns about the accuracy of the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Petherick. Are there any other members of the um, site inspection team who would like to make comments? Councillor Parker, you, you, you went first, yeah? That's fine. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, my comments are based purely and simply on the site um, meeting that we had. Um, I'd like to compliment uh, Jennifer on her presentation. It was most thorough and detailed. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's the big question, where do you start or finish with this proposal? There, there's so many factors, and no, no doubt, as we've already heard, there's many different views to be considered. My comments at this time are centered on my initial thoughts, and I know some of them have been overtaken now. They're based on my own observations, the officer's explanation, and questions posed by authorized attendees at the meeting. In my opinion, pressure, whether intended or not, at the site meeting by a large number of persons thought to be town council representatives was a little re re regrettable. This is a very detailed and complex proposal incorporating many mixed-use aspects which are very rare when constructed together. When you're talking about the large open market residential properties, the workshops, industrial, office space, holiday accommodation, 60 car parking, I could go on and on. But are all these possible on such a constrained site? Points that concern me were the access and egress onto the site from the 381 near the traffic lights at Morrison's. And furthermore, the bridge across the railway line in the ownership of Network Rail, the right of way of it and its condition. Also the linkage from the site into the town itself. Then a new slipway being constructed and the vicinity of some of the holiday units to part of this slipway and the use of the public in accessing these holiday units and the large four and five bedroom homes are a worry to me. Then you add in the office space and if fully occupied the additional traffic generated here on this partially reclaimed land is a concern. They add significantly to the safety fears on a site already widely used as boatyard works and storage. A question, is this correct area for office space also? It's already been mentioned, but the size and height of the office buildings and the residential would seem to me to rise above the railway line and the, and the adjoining A381 highway. Perhaps this is too high. The flood risk and likely increased flood risk from a few sources with climate change very much in mind is a concern. A substantial sea wall would definitely have to be a major fe feature here, but there's still effectively a flood risk in danger in place here, I think. The high visibility from the teen estuary, the road bridge, and from the other side of the river make the site very, very prominent. A fact, a development of some magnitude. In my opinion, the project must and does influence the visual amenity of the surroundings. It may seem that I have no positive comments to be made here, but individually there are a few good aspects, I believe, of the plan. I like the innovative design of the, uh, design of the three blocks of residential units, which together with their positioning would be a draw for possible residents, even if the quality of their living environment could be questioned. Their height must be questioned, however. I suppose these are all proposed on an open market basis in an attempt to make the whole, team, uh, whole scheme feasible. Other elements of the scheme do have merits when taken in isolation, such as the continued and improved boat, boat yard and the business use. The investment intended on the site, if deliverable and if viable, would be welcomed and could enhance the reputation 
and standing in the area. No doubt there could be a raft of conditions imposed to aid the approval of this application, but I feel there's a lot to overcome to make this acceptable at this time, and I would need further convincing at this time. And just excuse me, as I said, Chair, I do have to leave for another appointment. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Um, Councillor Kurzweil, did you want to... Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would also like to compliment our planning officer. That was a very, very good presentation. Thank you. Um, this is a huge application with many, many aspects. Um, I can see the good in it, and I can also see the problems. For me, um, the site as a whole, as it is at the moment, does certainly need some um, money put into it. It's not attractive. It does need upgrading. And I can see the merits in what the applicant is trying to do. On the other hand, I can also see that where the, um, the housing in itself um, is situated and the look of them and the height of them, um, I can see that that should be tweaked. The, the police report, especially with the um, car parking, where they're saying that um, you can't keep a, a close eye on um, criminal behavior within the, the car parking, that, that is a, a worry. Where, where I live, we have open areas of parking like this. Not a lot, but just a little. And you do get antisocial behavior because it's not visible. The um, access into the site has obviously been brought up a few times. And that is also a concern, especially with the um, few accidents that have been there. And also the bridge, which is not in the ownership of the, of the applicant. Um, the applicant, I understand from what he said, is a local guy. And I do love the idea of a local person doing, giving back to their community in whatever way they see fit, as long as they're giving back. And I do appreciate that. I, I do think that there is merit in pursuing this application, but maybe not as it is quite at the moment, but I await to hear from other people on this committee before I make my views as to whether I support it or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kurzweil. Um, I'd like to open it up for debate. I know, uh, Councillor McGregor, you raised your hand a moment ago. Are you happy to come in at this point to, to start us off, as it were? Thank you, Chair. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, I, the, the, the actual development overlaps slightly with my own ward, um, as it, it, Timoth West ends at the traffic lights and Bishop Stainton Ward begins at the traffic lights. So uh, a considerable part of the development overlaps with, with uh, Bishop Stainton Ward. The Bishop Staines Parish Council do feel that it's uh, an overdevelopment. That was one of the key elements. And the other key element that they mentioned was the access. Um, in terms of the, the development, I, I will depart slightly from Bishop Staines and Parish Council's view. Um, I've used the Ringmore Road uh, to come into Tynmouth a few times because of uh, traffic on the um, A381 has been substantial or blocked because of roadworks or accidents. And when you come down that road and you look across the river, the, the bit that's open to the, to the left as you're heading towards Shouldern, you see an eyesore. That's effectively what that, that boatyard is currently. It's an eyesore. It's a brownfield site. It needs redevelopment of some kind. The main issue is, of course, that we are talking about how that development looks and what it actually represents. But I want to take a few inconsistencies in the way that the council approaches certain aspects in relation to this development. 
it is outside the settlement limit, but that hasn't presented, prevented this council from looking at other sites for accommodation and employment that are outside the settlement limit. That are also within the undeveloped coast. So we're not taking a, we're not taking a consistent view here. We're not taking a consistent view of harm to class, uh, grade two listed buildings or structures or heritage assets. We don't take a consistent approach there. In actual fact, I'm thinking of one in Newton Abbott that's due to come up that will not affect just one directly, but will affect another very, very close by. So from my perspective, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure we can justify, with the distance from that heritage asset, anything more than the fact that there's a view impact. And as we all know from repeated discussions, nobody's entitled to a view. And that is quite an important aspect to, to remember. And particularly, it's not a residential view. It's a people should be focusing on the road ahead, not necessarily looking to left and right. In terms of impacts on the bridge itself, we passed some time ago a building construction at the very end of the bridge at the Tynmouth side, which was a complete de uh, uh, detraction from the buildings around. It's a modern glass fronted building, blockhouse style, as you approach the, the end of the bridge. So from, from that perspective, we, we're again looking at design and uh, development process, which isn't consistent if we're gonna take an approach here. The beach huts that were mentioned at the west end of the, um, the development, we were talked about, or, or the officer detailed about the walk from the car park to those beach huts. But anybody who lives in Dawlish will tell you the Dawlish beach huts are not accessible by car. It's a long walk along a seawall. And if you want to take stuff to and from it, you're going to have to pull a cart along that seawall. And you're going to be pulling a cart and there's potential, potentially pedestrians walking along backwards and forwards. So there are, there, are, there are inconsistencies in the way that we view things. And I don't think that's a justification for refusal on the basis of where the beach huts are in relation to the car parking. Because we already know that's an example in Dawlish. In terms of the actual height of these buildings, um, I understand obviously from the other side of the river they will look imposing f as a frontage on the river. But actually, if you're looking at the, from the other side of the river, where those buildings will interrupt the skyline, you see Estuary Court, Morrison's, and a very large, ugly and brown embankment. And that's an element of that particular site that is, is going to be addressed. You will not have a very ugly brown embankment and an industrial estate and an eyesore across the river. You'll have a properly developed, uh, nicely de designed um, development across the river that will give a better look for people coming from Bishop Stainton into Tynmouth and coming from Tynmouth towards Bishop Stainton. The only thing I can't overcome as an objection is the access. I think the access remains a problem and that is, that is the, the, the one area that I'd be looking for a little bit more information. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask, obviously you made some um, big points there, as it were. I'm going to ask if um, officers have got any responses to any of those at that point, or if you want me to come back. You, yeah, please. Yeah, so to respond to some of the points that were raised, so um, the consistency of decision making. So um, there is reference in the officer report to an employment scheme that was granted consent in the undeveloped coast. I was the case officer for that application and it was further up the estuary so it was closer to Newton Abbott and that again like this site was a balancing judgment you've got to consider the local plan as a whole and you've got to weigh the policies together um, the reason that consent I recommended approval of that scheme is because the scale of the building was quite small it was immediately adjacent to existing office development and it, it replicated the appearance of that development. And the scheme was supported by a, convin a convincing and deliverable soft landscaping screening scheme, which would mean that essentially there'd be tree planting immediately in front of the building to enhance what was kind of some scrub vegetation there at the moment, which over time would grow and would screen the development. There was also um, a high chance that that scheme would be 
deliverable and would be likely to come forward as it was put put forward to us. So, yeah, it's it's important, I think, to make that balancing judgment of every application. Um, it is possible to support development in the undeveloped coast if you feel that the other policies of the local plan you know, really do require that development to take place. The reason why I haven't reached a recommendation of approval for this scheme is simply due to the scale of the buildings in this, in this case, the concerns around the deliverability of the development as a whole and the absence of screening. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, the heritage asset, I think, like, every heritage asset is different. You can't sort of say, oh, um, this grade two building has these characteristics and that's therefore applicable to all grade two buildings. That's, that's just not how it works. So every, every listed building has its own special interest and its own heritage value. And in this case, which is quite unusual, we have the applicant's own heritage consultant advising us that the scheme would result in less than substantial harm. Um, so we really do have to take that quite seriously. Uh, the, other, the other point that I'd like to raise about the, the landscape impact is that the applicant's own landscape consultants considers that the scheme will have an adverse impact on the landscape. And I take your point about, um, Councillor McGregor, about the, um, there is other development on this edge of Timmouth which is large and ob visually obtrusive, such as the, um, the, the flat blocks which, um, you know, do take away from the landscape quality of the area. But then it's a case of, do we want to add to that harm? I, I think our policy environment is quite clear that we shouldn't. And then the other thing to bear in mind is that um, the site will be seen both during the day and at night. Um, at night, the large brown expanse of the um, sort of manufacture, the exposed cliff behind the site will appear in darkness. But these buildings, with their large amounts of glazing, will be lit up. So the impression of development during the night will be greatly increased during the day it will, it, you know, it will blend more with the surroundings. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, oh, do you want me to answer on the highways as well? No, that's fine. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you for that. Um, can I open this up now for debate? Uh, Councillor Dewhurst, you've indicated you'd like to speak, please. Th th thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, I look at this and uh, there are, um, a, as our officer in, in her very good report um, has, has mentioned, a, a large number of really concerning uh, issues. Um, the loss of, uh, of, of green infrastructure, the, the loss of um, the sea, uh, the 800 uh, square metres, of uh, of coastline um, I think is really really concerning uh, particularly as this council has declared um, a, a climate an environmental e emergency uh, that concerns me greatly the, the heritage uh, a aspects um, we talked a lot about uh, Shalden Bridge um, and its grade 2 status but there's as we heard um, from uh, the speaker in f against this uh, application, uh, there are um, other Grade Two properties in the Strand in Ringmore, one of the gems of the South Devon coast, uh, and uh, to to have the kind of really in-your-face development on the other side of the river from there, uh, I, I think is 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 just hugely detrimental. Um, I think the lack of landscaping on the site um, is, is, is really concerning. Just, it just appears to be just one little tiny sort of patch of, of green there um, and, 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 and nothing else. So the starkness of this, when viewed from all the views uh, around the, the, the estuary, um, will really sort of pull it out uh, and uh, I think be really detrimental. Um, I'm 
also concerned about the uh, uh, the public right of way. Uh, I would have thought that that was something that uh, the applicant uh, might wish to uh, um, help the, the local community we, with that. Um, other issues, we, we heard about um, affordable office space, affordable uh, workshop space, but there's nothing in here that I can see that actually says that they're affordable, and I'm not quite sure what affordable um, industrial space actually is. Um, is, there a, is there a sort of definition um, of, of that? Um, so I, I, do, I, I do commend uh, the applicant for bringing something forward, but personally, I really think it needs lots more work before it becomes really something that certainly for me, I could support. Uh, and therefore, for that reason, um, I'm happy to um, uh, propose, uh, Chair, um, that we, uh, we recommend uh, refusal um, on the grounds as set out in the papers. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor um, Dewhurst. I didn't know if you wanted to ask, I can ask the officers to consider your point on the affordable industrial space and see if there's any other response to that. But I'll see if there's anyone else who wants to come into the debate as well. I have Councillor Hook. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, well, I, I started thinking about this site, I think, in, in the sense of um, local plan policy, which is where we should start. And again, I, I want to thank Jennifer for her, her um, summing up of um, the position of the council. Um, and when I balance up local plan policy, I come to the same conclusion that really, um, going into the detail of the technical reasons, which is what I started to do, um, didn't really, even if, um, I think I was concerned that the applicant had submitted information that we were unable to look at, and that did concern me. Um, in particular, if there's new viability information, that particularly concerned me. Um, and my starting point was to be concerned about that and wanting to have a full set of information on which to base any decision that I made. But as I thought more about the technical reasons and the substantive reason, um, I thought, well, even if all those technical reasons and that information that was provided helped me maybe put those to one side and dismiss possibly those technical reasons. None of those would deal with the substantive reason, um, the, primarily the um, design and the massing of the design um, would not be dealt with by any of those um, matters. Um, I mean, it's interesting, the viability information, because as I started reading through as well, I thought, why are we considering the viability of the proposition? Because normally, of course, you wouldn't do that. It's up to the applicant to decide whether a proposal is economically viable. It's not for us to question that. But the reason we're doing that, of course, is because this site would require us to have affordable housing. Being outside the settlement limit, more than four dwellings, we have a requirement for there to be affordable dwellings. And that's exactly what West Timmouth needs. So on that basis, you could start thinking, well, OK, we'll, we'll look at this. But then when you realise that the affordable housing is not being proposed, that's where the viability comes in. Because then you could say, as, as exactly it says in the officer report, if the application as a whole could convincingly demonstrate that the public benefits of the scheme were sufficient to justify a wholly market-led, wholly market-dwelling development, then the planning authority may in, be in a position to support a proposal with no affordable housing. So that is why we've had to go away and look at viability, and that's why I was concerned that we hadn't been able to look at the applicant's own more up-to-date viability evidence. Um, but then even reflecting on that, and even if um, it was viable, and even if it could provide affordable housing units, it still doesn't de deal with the substantive issue of the design and massing, which quite frankly is huge. That office block is huge. Um, the residential units are huge. Um, although the design, yeah, design of the residential units is 
acceptable maybe in other locations, possibly not that one. So the conclusion I've come to is that I, I cannot um, see this current scheme as satisfying that o overriding substantive objection. But I can see maybe another scheme would. And, and I, you know, my advice would be to go away, look at it again, and, and come back with something else. Because you know, obviously there's public support for this, um, a degree. I'm not saying it's not the whole of Timmouth. Obviously there are, there are objections. But there is a good deal of support. And you know, it would be nice to support a development on this site. This isn't the right one, and, I, and you know, I'd like to see something else come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hook. Um, we've heard from several people who are uh, against the proposal, and we have, in fact, before us a proposal um, on the table to refuse as set out from Councillor Dewhurst. So can I... Thank, thank you, Councillor Hook. You, you've, you're seconding that proposal. Um, are there any other members who wish to make any comments or have any more clarity at this point before we go to a vote? Councillor McGregor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to talk uh, briefly about a, a point I forgot earlier, which about, is about the, um, the squaring off of the site in terms of the uh, 883 uh, square metres of, of uh, tidal, tidal area lost. Um, there's a helpful uh, illustration provided um, on page 16, top of page 16 on the, on the report, that actually shows the intention once upon a time was for two or three football pitch sized areas to be reclaimed from the estuary for that site back in, back in, the, in the 70s and 80s, which, which didn't come to pass. But what we're actually seeing here is the, the, the footprint of the current site is not largely increased by the um, by the by the uh, change to the seawall that's proposed it actually is a, more of a squaring off and an infilling of bits behind that and I don't think we really should judge that too harshly in terms of our environmental uh, and um, biodiversity uh, um, declarations because in actual fact a lot of that um, tidal is directly impacted already by works going on at the boatyard. So it's disturbed. Um, it's a disturbed area. It's not. It's not a, a quiet uh, piece of beach halfway along the estuary where there's nothing around it. Um, and the current s s design of the site means that there is potentially leaching of, of uh, chemicals from the site into the, the estuary around the boatyard anyway. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's particularly bad, but if we look at the, the, the design of the, the port, um, there, is, there is leaching from the port uh, in terms of product that, that blows off from boats and, and lorries into the, into the water by the, by the port. So, you know, from that perspective, again, I don't know if that impact is, is as great as being implied. Thank you. Thank you for your points. Um, I, I don't know if uh, officers were going to come back on any of that, but we do have a, a proposal on the table and it has been seconded, so I'll give a, a moment for officers if there's anything they want to, to reiterate on that. And can you clarify the, the, the loss of space as I understood? It was 838 square metres. Is that? I made a note of that when it was said before. Yeah, so is that's correct. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, to clarify that... Um, so we've got this area of 838 square metres. It's, for the, the teen estuary is, the entirety of the teen estuary is a county wildlife site. So this isn't just, um, uh, you know, land around the port. And we do appreciate that there are potential contamination risks at the moment arising from the site and that resolving those contamina contamination risks is a good thing. But we just don't see that that positive is outweighed by the, the reclamation of this large area of land. Um, it's encircling with a, a wall that's only necessary because of the flood risk to the residential properties um, and then the, the subsequent loss of this intertidal habitat. So it is, a, it is a designated county wildlife site at the moment. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, so we have a, a proposal um, as set out on the, uh, the document in front of you members. Um, that has been proposed by Councillor Dewhurst has been seconded by Councillor Hook. Um, and we're going to go to the vote, please, members, but it is by roll call. So um, I'll leave it over to Chris to, to call out the, uh, the names and take the details. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
So we'll start with Councillor Bradford. Councillor Colclough. Councillor Dewhurst. Councillor Hook. Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Kurzweil. Councillor McGregor. Councillor Nutley. Councillor Ross. Oh, no, she's not here. Councillor Bra Br Councillor Goodman Bradbury. And Councillor John Petherick. Chair, sure. sorry. Chair, that's um, eight for two against, so it's been carried. So the proposal has been carried, so um, that item has been uh, refused as set out. Um, we will now um, move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you. We have no um, major decisions summary to, to concern ourselves with but we do have appeal decisions to note I understand we've got people going to be leaving us but I will just take us through that um, are any questions or any comments to make on the appeal decisions that we have on the agenda no. are members happy to note that can I see a show of, of hands from that point of view thank you so everyone voted in favour to, to note that. So that is the conclusion of the, the planning meeting today. Thank you very much for your time today um, and for all of the, the speakers and people who came along today. If I can ask you to stay in your seats until we confirm the filming is off. Thank you.